Hey everyone, this is John Buck back with another array signal processing video. In this video, we're going to talk about the topic of array shading, or it's sometimes called array tapering or array weighting, uh, all, all these different names for the same thing. But basically the idea that by changing the uh, amount of weight we give to each sensor in the array, we can trade off between the uh, main lobe width and the side lobe in the beam pattern and, and use that to our advantage at times. So let me uh, switch over to the whiteboard and we'll talk some more about it there. So in this class, we're going to take the next step beyond the basic ideas of the conventional beam former. Uh, we saw in one of the class problems we did last week this idea that when we take the, the beam pattern and we multiply the beam pattern with the scanned response to understand how much output power we're going to see, that sometimes a loud interferer that's technically outside the passband, outside the, the, the main beam of the, of the beam former, may be so loud that it will be, even with the, the attenuation, it will still provide most of the power to the signal, a, a phenomenon called masking. And we'll talk more about that today. Um, and so we need to find a better tool than the conventional beam pattern to let us manage that and, or, or control that situation. So we saw so far that if we want to have a conventional beam former, we can choose our array weights to look in the, if we steer in the UT direction, it's going to be one over N times the replica vector V for that direction, right? This is our conventional beam former, and this will have have a gain of, you know, the gain will be equal to one for all signals coming from that UT direction, and it will attenuate things outside of its its main lobe or outside of its null to null beam width, and so that's our starting point. But as we said, what, what do we do when the interferer gets too loud? Well, we say it'd be nice if we could somehow find a way to make those side lobes smaller. How can we reduce the side lobes to make them smaller? What I want you to do is try to draw on your intuition from time domain DSP, pause the video for a second and think and say, well, what, what technique have I seen for a finite set for a filter that's a finite impulse filter to, to make the side lobes smaller? Okay, we're back, and hopefully you remembered the idea of the windowed FIR filter from time domain DSP. This was the idea that we would take the finite length ideal impulse response, and it, by putting some uh, tapering or smoothing on it, which we usually call a window, something like a Hanning or Hamming window, we would reduce the uh, side lobes and get a filter that was better, had more attenuation outside of the passband. Uh, and the idea here, in a that we'll call this array shading or sometimes called it, uh, tapering, is exactly the same idea for our array processing. So if you're familiar with that story, everything we're going to talk about today, you should already be the things you're familiar with, just putting it in a new perspective for spatial processing rather than time domain processing. But all the uh, windows, the common windows we use are very much the same windows. Uh, and, and the uh, design trade-offs and the, and the performance factors we're looking for, how we characterize the performance, the issues are the same issues. Right, so, so again, I'll do another of these little uh, recall exercises. When you think about windowed FIR filter design, what's the fundamental trade-off we make? Or what's the cost? If we, if we apply a window to an ideal filter, to, to the, the tr uh, short and a finite chunk of the ideal impulse response, we can reduce the side lobes by applying that, that window to it. But what's the cost we pay? What's the trade-off in an engineering sense? So again, pause the video and think about that. Good. Now that we're back, the, the trade-off hopefully remember is that when we're designing uh, windowed FIR filters, we're always having a trade-off between the width of the transition band, that is how, much, how, how wide a band of frequency it gets us to get from, requires to go from the pass band to the stop band, versus the stop band attenuation, how much we can attenuate things outside of the pass band. The more attenuation we have, in general as a rule of thumb, the wider a frequency band it takes us to get from the pass band down to the attenuated stop band. And we'll see the same type of story plays out today. That when we start, we can reduce the side lobes and make us better at rejecting those out of, out of band interferers, those, those interferers that are not inside the main beam. But the cost of doing that is that the main beam gets wider, that we, we lose some of our ability to have such spatial, good spatial select, selectivity. Okay, and, and, and that becomes important because we're, we're trying to control a trade-off between two things. So let's talk about the two issues for performance. When we think about 
the same idea with the beam pattern. The two issues for, for the beam former performance in general. Okay, the first issue is resolution. Resolution is my ability to distinguish two closely spaced sources. So two things that are coming from very similar angles of arrival with comparable, they don't have to be equal, but roughly equal, comparable power from a single source. So when do I have enough angular resolution or ability to look out and say, is that when I'm, when I'm looking at my scan response, my ability to say, is that peak a single loud thing or is it two closely spaced loud things? When am I able to separate them in angle? That's what we call resolution. The second issue is called masking. And that's the example we already saw in the class problem earlier, which is this, this is what happens when a distant source, I just, uh, a, dist a source that is distance and angle is what I really mean. So maybe it's better just to say when a source outside the main the main beam uh, is so loud that it overpowers the beamformer response and so then we say it masks any signals that are within the main beam so this is like the example we saw in the class problems where we have such a loud interferer that even after it's reduced by 13 or 16 or 18 db by the side lobes it still has more power contributed to the output than something quiet within the main lobe that is within the main beam. And then we say that thing is masking it. If we looked at our, uh, at our scan response, we would not see a peak caused by the quiet signal we're looking for. So, that, so resolution is what happens when the, the challenge we have when two things are roughly equal in power, but they start to get close together. Can I see them as two separate things in the scanned response? The masking is when I have these things that may be a little further apart, but one is so loud that even though it's outside the main beam and should be attenuated, the side lobes are not small enough to bring it down and it ends up hiding the main lobe. All right, so that's sort of the, the big picture issues we're going to talk about. Uh, if we, if, if, uh, what, what we'll do, I'm going to stop this video here now that we've done the conceptual big picture, break it up using the same, same approach we've used all along. Now that we've talked about the big concept, we're going to get technical with the details of the mathematics, but I'll save that for the second video just to, to sort of space it out a little bit. Okay, so I'll see you in a moment in the next video.